on this Transfiguration Sunday, you'll notice that much of the liturgy, even the hymn texts, refer to light and love and God's grace revealed to us. That was there in the first uh, scripture lesson that Dr. Ed read, talking about the light of the gospel, the glory of the Lord seen in Christ. So as that theme continues, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer as we hear again the story of the transfiguration of Christ. Let us pray. Living and gracious God, by your spirit fall down upon us, Illuminate in us all that we should see, chasing away shadows. Guide us forward that we may walk according to your will. And then strengthen us for the journey ahead, that as we prepare for the season of Lent and we prepare for whatever comes, we will know and trust you are beside us. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Pastor Heather has already made reference to this famous story. This is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. It's found in some of the other Gospels as well, but it's the story of the transfiguration of Christ. Listen for God's word. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say. For they were terrified. And then a crowd, a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice This is my son, the beloved one. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, as Pastor Heather has already alluded to, a lot happens in this story. Symbolic things, amazing things, important things. We're told that Jesus is up on a mountaintop, which calls to mind the mountain that Moses climbed when he met with God and received the Ten Commandments. And speaking of Moses, in this story, he is there beside Jesus. And the dazzling white clothes that are described is another reminder of that ancient encounter on Mount Sinai long ago. And if all that wasn't enough, Elijah was there as well. Elijah the prophet, the one who'd been whisked off to heaven in a golden chariot, the last of the great prophets. So Jesus, Moses, Elijah, dazzling raiment, a mountaintop experience, a cloud then that overshadows them and a voice calling out, listen to him, my beloved son. And then the entire vision is swept away, gone in a flash. It was a lot for Peter, James, and John to process. Scripture even comments that they were terrified and didn't know what to say. But good old Peter stammers out a brief sentence of hospitality. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. It's good to be here. Little did Peter realize how true those words actually were. Now, the main focus of the whole transfiguration story comes, appropriately enough, from what happened to Jesus. Jesus transfigured, his robes now glowing, this conversation he has with Moses and Elijah. All of that points to the divine and human natures in Christ coming together and being seen in their fullness. It emphasizes, too, that God's will for us is most clear when we listen to Jesus, when we follow as he leads. But how exactly is that supposed to happen? In order to answer that question, we need to 
turn our gaze away from Jesus and his glowing white robes and focus instead on the perhaps more mundane garments being worn by the three fishermen disciples and to see in their surprised, dumbstruck faces a hint to how we too may be responding to God faithfully. So the first transfiguration lesson. Although Jesus really likes working one-on-one, it seems that Jesus loves small group ministry. There are lots of time that Jesus' ministry was advanced because of the efforts of a single person. There was the boy whose lunch of bread and fish became a meal for a crowd of 5,000. There was the one Samaritan woman he met by the well who eventually learned about the true water of life and then went out and converted her entire village. But ultimately, Jesus prefers to work with small groups. We're told that when he sent out his disciples to proclaim the good news in neighboring villages, he sent them out in pairs of two. When he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, or in this case, when he went up the mountaintop to meet with Moses and Elijah, he then invites beside him a small group of three disciples. And scripture reminds us, whenever two or three are gathered together, I am there in your midst, says the Lord. In an amazing Presbyterian nuance, I think Jesus actually likes working with committees. Think about it. How many times in a committee meeting has a new idea emerged because someone around the table spoke up? How often is that insight only possible when the people around the table are diverse in gender, age, race, and experience? Sometimes God relies on small groups, not just the uniform bubbles that are created by our social media logarithms, but diverse groups, fellowships called together by the Holy Spirit. It's an important part of following Jesus to remember that we follow Jesus with others. Now the second transfiguration lesson. God has a big strategy, and it's actually a very simple one. Every generation is given the task to teach the next generation. Everyone needs a strategy for success. There was once a family reunion that gathered together a large group of people And they decided for the activities at that reunion, they would have a softball game between the children and the grown-ups. Now, the kids quickly got together. As they decided what their strategy should be against playing the adults, they said, let's hit a lot of grounders because grown-ups can't bend down. And the kids did win the game. Now, that particular strategy emphasized a weakness in order to gain victory. But God's strategy relies on a strength. God's strategy of propagating the gospel builds on the strength of our love for our children, our love of passing on the wisdom we've gained in our life to those who will follow us. See, realize Jesus could have met Moses and Elijah anywhere, any time. He could have held a secret gathering far from the eyes of others. But in this case, the transfiguration intentionally happened in front of Peter, James, and John. Jesus actually wants us around. Jesus, in John chapter 17, prays, saying, God, I desire that those also whom you've given me may be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, so that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The resurrected Christ appeared to the women at the tomb precisely so they would tell the news to others. The Gospels were written so that what had been seen and believed by one generation might then be shared and passed on for generations to come. Jesus wants us around. Jesus wants us to tell others by our words and deeds just who it is we hang around with, who is our light, who is our hope, who is our Lord. And all that leads to the third and perhaps most important transfiguration lesson. 
there are times in each of our lives when we too, like Peter, will say the words, it is good for me to be here. Way back in the 1600s, someone warned King Charles II of England that if the ravens ever left the Tower of London, then the entire British Empire would collapse. So to this day, they still make sure that at least six ravens are living and brooding and remaining on the grounds of the Tower of London. In a similar way, there's an old Jewish legend that says that every generation of people on the earth contains at least 36 righteous people who together are just enough to assure that God will not destroy the earth. The righteous ones are called tzadakim. They don't know one another, nor are they particularly famous in the world's eyes. They could be you or me or the person beside you, or the driver in the car in front of you. The idea of the Sadakim is designed to fill us with humility, to realize that the entire world's fate perhaps rests upon the moral actions of a small group of unsung saints around the world. And it reminds us that we have to protect one another, for woe be upon us if because of our actions, suddenly the survival threshold of 36 Sadakim fell below that level. Now I tell that story as an indirect way to answer a different question. The question, why are we here? Why do we exist? That's a perennial question that sometimes we ask of ourselves. Why am I here when maybe... I've had a brush with death when maybe I've been recovering from a serious illness or loved ones and peers have died and left this life and yet each morning I still wake up and I'm here. Part of the answer to the question, why am I here, actually is better answered when we approach it with a different question. When we ask ourselves, well, when was it that I've said the phrase, it is good to be here? Now, I'm not thinking about heroic moments, but simple moments like when it was good for you to be able to sit beside a friend who was grieving or in pain. It was good when you were able to drive someone to a doctor's appointment or drop off food for a shut-in. That it was good when you were able to offer a listening ear or a word of advice. I'm thinking of the times when you did your job well, when your expertise righted something that was wrong, when your leadership moved a goal forward. It's good I was here. May have been on your lips when you're sitting together and laughing with friends, when you speak a vow to another person and truly mean it. When you notice someone that's on the margins of life and you extend a hand and welcome and invite them, to join the group. The wonderful spiritual teacher Joan Chittister once wrote that the only purpose of the spiritual life is to begin to see the world as God sees the world. It's about becoming the self that sees life through the eyes of Jesus and then, like Jesus, bends to become the miracle the world awaits. We are to bend to become the miracle the world awaits, to lift up someone who's fallen, to speak up for someone long silenced, for insisting that the history of people of color in this land has been erased and diminished for far too long and needs to be heard and honored and remembered, for knowing that we as a nation spend far too much money on learning how to destroy life and it's high time we began focusing on how to preserve life. On that mountaintop long ago, Peter was overwhelmed, even terrified, and didn't know what to say. And so he humbly offered a word of, of hospitality. It's good for us to be here, that we might serve you, help you. 
Now that's a powerful word of encouragement. And actually by faith, I think it should be our mantra every morning when we open our eyes. Because in that simple phrase, all three lessons of the transfiguration come together. One, Peter said, it is good for us to be here. First person plural. Jesus loves small groups. Whatever needs to be done in this life, is more than likely something that has to be done together. Two, Peter addressed his comments directly to Jesus, saying, Rabbi, it is good to be here, to be with you, to to see this revelation with our own eyes that we might be witnesses to this in the times to come and to pass on this good news for generations. And three, lastly, Peter named a fundamental fact about life. It is good to be here. It's good to be alive. It's good to be a person, a Pittsburgher, a tzaddik, a righteous soul. It's good to be someone trying their best for the sake of this world today and a kingdom of love coming tomorrow. It's good to be a follower of the one who is truth, love, and abundant life. So on this Valentine's Day, on this moment in Black History Month, on this the Lord's Day, it is good for us to be here. We were never intended to stay on mountaintops. We were meant to be right here, journeying down the path of life, serving in this community, walking with Christ and praying, Lord, Guide my feet, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Peter didn't know what to say, but in the end, he said precisely the right thing. And if you feel like Peter, well, trust that with Christ, it is always good to be here. Thanks be to God. Amen.